morning. Welcome to our Claude Shannon Centennial Celebration. My name is Ellen Ferguson. I'm responsible for Bell Labs planning and operations. One of the many joys of this job has been organizing this wonderful event, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we are filming for a documentary as well as you'll see demos later and visionary speakers as well as fireside chat. While we want your phones silenced, we do encourage you to tweet. We have hashtag Shannon100 if you'd like to share your excitement with the rest of the world. That would be great. And to start off our celebration, I have the honor of introducing the president of Bell Labs and Nokia CTO, Marcus Weldon. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's, uh, it's great to be here. So, looking around I see a tremendous number of truly great people, except the ones at the back. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fantastic you can be here today. Uh, I see this sort of as Bell Labs as a place, as being a place that birthed the information age. And you all are contributors to that, either in the past, the present, and the future. So we're going to explore that today, uh, together. My preamble is going to be short. Those of you who've read this know that is uh, not typical of me. Someone pointed out uh, I consumed four pages of the booklet just saying hello. <laughs> but I am going to be brief because you're going to hear more than enough from me uh, over the next uh, 24 hours. And those of you who are staying tomorrow, God help you. Uh, so I'm only going to talk about two things today. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the place you're in, Bell Labs. Uh, many of you have been here before, but some not. Uh, and I'm going to talk, of course, about Claude Shannon. And we're going to have some fun, of course. Uh, so Bell Labs, this 90-year-old institution, uh, perhaps is the greatest industrial research lab ever created. And I think uh, not many would dispute that. Others have competed. Xerox Park, IBM, HP, etc. But I think we're the only one that has invented as much as we have uh, and remain a vibrant, thriving organization today. Just to give you a number, there are a thousand researchers in Bell Labs, and by all accounts, that's about where we were at the peak uh, if you don't include the technical support. So we're in a good place. But let's just recall for a minute what we've done in the past and up to the present. Which other institution has invented the transistor, the laser, the CCD, solar panel, Unix, C, C++, <coughs> Shannon theory, of course, Shannon limit, the nonlinear Shannon limit, because we saw there was an issue in optical fiber, optical transmission, DWDM, cellular networks, MIMO, to name just a year's worth. It's more than a year's worth. But the problem we have today, and, and some part of the reason for this conference, or at least a theme of the conference, is that uh, it's not well understood the value of this network infrastructure and the control systems and software that underpin our digital lives. <laughs> so we have decided to unveil something no one's ever seen before. In fact, we've kept it in the catacombs of Bell Labs uh, for a long time, uh, but we're going to reveal it today as long as you promise not to share it. We think governmental entities may come a-running if they see what it's capable of. So uh, I'm going to show you. Are you ready for this? You, you, this is Bell Labs friends and family only. So you are officially now, when I reveal this, uh, inducted into the Bell Labs friends and family. You can speak no more of this. Of course, it'll be in Twitter in an instant. So this is what we have. <laughs> I have to give credit to, to one of the people here, Martin Carroll, who said, do we have a switch that turns them off? So this is what it is. Bell Labs Innovations on, off. Uh, and if I throw this switch, all the Bell Labs Innovations uh, in the world uh, will be turned off if it works correctly. We've never actually tried it before. We were afraid. So, but we're going to try it today. Are you ready? Want to give it a whirl? All right, here we go. One, two, three. So, as you see, it becomes increasingly hard to see, 
to communicate, to control, to compute things. Yes, I see a, a smartphone on there, here and there, a laptop here and there. We haven't quite got to controlling those, but we'll get there soon. <laughs> and I think uh, Eric and Owen and Paul uh, can probably give us a hand with that. So I'm going to try and uh, turn things back on. Of course, we should get on with things. <laughs> Again, this isn't going to work. Ah, we're back. There you are, the power of Bell Labs. Uh, so what I'm now going to talk about is Claude a bit. Um, I, th I think there's a, there's a serious point here, uh, and that is, all joking aside, uh, Bell Labs and, and its uh, great innovators like Claude Shannon uh, really have laid the fundaments of our past and present and continue to do that. In fact, going forward, we believe there'll be a sort of revolution in networking because we've reached the limit of the physics uh, that we can utilize over the distances we've built the network. So centralized isn't going to work anymore. We have to go distributed. We have to do that to get scale and capacity and also reduce the latency. So we're going to build a brand new network over the next 10 years Broadly, we could consider it 5G, but 5G is an end-to-end, up-and-down, left-and-right network architecture. You're going to hear about that today on the tours you take, actually, that Bell Labs is still very relevant in inventing that future. But let's go back to Claude, because if it weren't for Claude, none of this would be... It would be possible, but not well-designed. We wouldn't have optimized anything. We would be stumbling around in the dark, trying to figure out whether that channel was good enough, whether different channels had different properties under different conditions. And of course, Claude solved for that, not just for one time, but for all time. Well, I'm going to let Claude introduce himself. Now, since he's speaking to you from beyond the grave, the quality of the communication channel you will see is not fantastic. It turns out you can exist there, but it's a highly entropic, disordered channel. So without further ado, over to Claude. <laughs> Hello, I'm Claude Shannon, a mathematician here at the Bell Telephone Laboratory. This is Spacious. Spacious is an electrically controlled knob. He has the ability to solve a certain class of problems by trial and error means, and then remember the solution. In other words, he can learn from experience. Like his classical namesake, Spacious has a problem of finding his way through a maze. His objective is the goal here in the corner. He is now exploring the maze using a rather involved strategy of trial and error. As he finds the correct path, he registers the information in his memory. Later, I can put him down in any part of the maze that he's already explored, and he'll be able to go directly to the goal without making a single false turn. bank of relays, telephone relays, and the job they do for C-Suits is similar to the job they do in your dial telephone system. Each time you use your telephone, the dial system has to remember the number of two dials, then guide your call through the maze of connections, the thousands of separate lines in a dial switching on. In a fraction of a second, you must find the trunk line for you to carry your call. It also has to remember and it's stuff. What sequence of steps are necessary to make the connection for you? Here at the Bell Telephone Laboratory, we're concerned with improving your telephone system, making it work better to give you more efficient service. One of our continuing projects is on dial switching. Incidentally, the things we learn for the telephone system have other applications, too. We can use these telephone relays to build computing machines, machines that can solve mathematical problems in a few minutes and would otherwise take many days to solve. C2 is a simple demonstration of some of the things we can do with telephone relays. He's now had a chance to find his way through the maze, and there he's reaching the goal. Now let's see how well he remembers what he's learned. Seafood is capable of other types of intelligent behavior. 
He can add new information and adapt to changes. If the entire maze or part of it, for example, is changed, he will explore the changed area. Replacing the old information is no longer of value by the new information he's just learned. Here, let me show you what I mean. When Theseus is exploring a maze, he rotates his trial direction for any square in a clockwise manner, north and east and south and west, until he's able to escape from the square. He also takes account of the direction by which he entered the square and what his previous knowledge from the last time he was there. A theorem from that branch of mathematics known as topology guarantees that his method of exploration will eventually solve any possible maze. Of course, not only me and the species can solve any problem that can be solved, like the rest of it, he occasionally finds himself in a situation something like this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my favorite part of the end, uh, the little smirk. Uh, you can clearly see that Claude had a tremendous sense of humor. In fact, those of you who are attending tonight's uh, Human Digital Orchestra performance, uh, we explore that aspect of him as juggler, comedian, musician. Uh, but there's a point again. The point is, if you, if you remember the story he tells, he tells the story that we were working on telephony, needed to improve switching architecture, use that for computing systems. Another part of that video, which I cut, is that became guidance systems for missiles. So that's typically the Bell Labs way that we continue today. We think about the big problems confronting humankind in communications, networking, and related systems. And we solve those. We solve them in a way where we push beyond the known limits and define new limits. And I think that's uh, exactly what we're going to explore today. So today, I'm just going to uh, mention that we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. In the morning, we have uh, the awardees. We, we've uh, created a new award called the Bell Labs Shannon Visionary, Visionary Award that we will award annually. Uh, there's five winners to start with, uh, Eric, Bob, uh, Owen, Henry, and Amber. They're going to give the talks this morning. I think you will find it a thrilling ride through various aspects of uh, information society and new systems and processes and ways of thinking. So without further ado, I'm actually going to leave you. Well, I'm going to sit right there. But I'm going to hand over to uh, the introducer for the first speaker, uh, which will be Thierry Klein. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> Marcus. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure and a true honor for me to introduce Urban Jacobs today, the co-founding chairman and uh, CEO emeritus of Qualcomm. Uh, actually, it's the second time I have the honor of introducing Urban Jacobs. The first time was at the student organized conference at MIT some 17 years ago. So it's been a little while. Um, he's a true visionary uh, for our industry and for our time. And he has uh, impacted society so much. Um, Throughout his distinguished career, he has achieved the pinnacle of success in academia and business. Starting with his faculty position at MIT and the UCSD, he wrote a book on the principles of communication engineering, which is still a reference today and used by many. Perhaps the biggest impact he's made was on the commercial side with the founding of Qualcomm in 1985. He has really connected the world and built up Qualcomm from a startup to become a pioneer and a leader in the wireless industry. To date, more than three billion people have used and benefited from Qualcomm technologies. I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience today has at least one or two, if not more, Qualcomm chips in their pockets today. He's on a very, very short list of true luminaries for the information age. Without his impact, his vision, his business acumen, his technical expertise, the world in general and our industry and our society would not be where it is today. Please help me welcome Irvin Jacobs to Bell Labs. <laughs> Great to be back here at the Bell Laboratories. It's been a long time, and it does bring back some great memories, and I'm sure much yet to be done here, so it's uh, great to be part of the celebration, and of course to be remembering Claude Shannon. I first encountered Claude when I went into graduate school from after graduating Cornell University. Because I had some very good courses in antennas and electromagnetic theory, I thought I would do my graduate work in that area. But there was so much excitement 
around MIT because of Claude coming on as a faculty member, that that quickly became contagious. And I decided communications information theory was indeed uh, the right direction to go. That led uh, to my, uh, ultimately, my doctoral thesis, which was connectivity and probabilistic graphs. And in looking into that and doing the background research, what did I find but a key paper on reliability using unreliable components at that time, I think relays, that was written by Claude and had a lot of excellent mathematics, et cetera, and so helped me in putting together my own thesis. I was lucky enough to then be asked to stay on to teach uh, at MIT. And uh, then with Jack Wozencraft, we had the opportunity to start a new communications course for seniors. And so we had a little bit of debate as about how to go. In fact, a number of faculty members said, oh, if you're going to teach some information theory, treat it as applied mathematics. But our hope was that we'd be able to present it as really the future of communication engineering. And so we tried to bias the class and then the book that came out, Principles of Communication Engineering, in a direction that both provided some understanding of the theory, but also that indeed it could be very practical. And indeed, I remember one of the measures uh, uh, that was in the book was energy per bit to noise zero, to N zero to the noise level, EBN N zero. And Claude had, in his capacity theorems, said that there was a minimum of EB to N zero we had to provide in order to get error free or low error performance, and that you could approach that with appropriate modulation and coding in particular. And so that was interesting, but at the time, the only place it seemed that low EB on N zero would be critical was in satellite communications where you couldn't put too much power up there. What I didn't realize is that later, and I'll come back to it, it'll be quite key in cellular communications. So that was one aspect. There was another, and some homework problems where we had arrays of signal points. And again, it was to be able to demonstrate and make sure people understood the, the aspects of communication theory. Again, not realizing that indeed it would become very practical. And so now with the higher data rate wireless communications, you see all these arrays that are being used. So the book indeed did turn out to be uh, kind of predicting a little bit of the future. And that was our hope, our intent. But of course, you can never predict what actually has turned out as far as the use of digital in just about uh, everything. When I was on the faculty also, well, you had the opportunity to bring students out to Claude Shannon's home. And uh, he was always very gracious about it. Uh, he had a ski lift type device that went down to the lake. Uh, but importantly, I think you just saw some of the toys that he always played with. He had a lot of toys around the house. And so the students, and myself obviously, and other faculty, always had fun seeing what was the latest uh, type of toys that were there. And I often think that now with the capabilities that you have on the chips that are in a cell phone and the ability to go, work with a whole variety of sensors and capabilities, that uh, Claude would be able to develop some really amazing chips and uh, some really amazing toys and robots, uh, drones. Uh, he would have just had a great time with all these, these things. In any case, I taught at MIT for seven years, but you have to be careful sometimes. We decided to take a one-year leave to go to California. And uh, <laughs> we thought that, that could be interesting. Spent uh, nine months at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Came back, just after coming back, a former professor from Cornell called, said there's a brand new university starting in San Diego, University of California, San Diego. Would we come out and help start uh, engineering there? But leaving the East Coast with family, friends, career was different. So we turned it down initially. It's funny the way these little changes occur in one's life that you don't quite predict. Uh, this was one of them for sure. Because the second day was a heavy rainstorm. <laughs> Came home soaking wet. 
my wife Joan, uh, uh, said, listen to this, and read me a description of a nice home. I said, let's go see it. We've been looking for a home around the Boston area. She said, only one problem, it's in La Jolla, California. <laughs> We decided, okay, that's enough. <laughs> we called up and said, we're coming. And out we went to UCSD. It was interesting because UCSD was organized on a large college system by colleges. And the second college to be formed was Muir College. And they decided to have some fellows named for Muir College. And we convinced them that Claude Chan would be a very appropriate cho uh, choice. So Claude actually came out to San Diego, unfortunately he didn't settle there, but came out to San Diego and spent a week with us and has ever since been a, uh, uh, a fellow of the uh, Muir College. And we had time to talk about various things. One of those items, he had been working on analyzing the stock market and how should you be making investments, et cetera, et cetera. And I knew he had been very successful with his investments. So I asked whether he could kind of give us some information, some insight into that theory. He said, well, there is the theory, but all my investments are made based on the person running the company. <laughs> so uh, that, uh, that's something I think we've all taken to heart at various times. That, that's obviously key. In any case, it was because of moving out to California and because of having written the textbook with Jack Rosencraft, that there were lots of requests for consulting. And one day coming down from Ames with Len Kleinmark, I think it is here somewhere, and uh, Andy Viterbi uh, mentioned that there was a lot of consulting. They said, let's start a, a company and share consulting. And so that's the first company, Link a Bit, which was about the 11th name we had on the list we submitted and the first one the uh, California state people accepted. So. Uh, we started Linkabit, but it began to grow rather rapidly, and so I decided I'd better take some time off and get things organized. Did that in 71, and uh, then decided to leave the University of Rhodes as an academic in 72. Um, why? Well, first of all, indeed, it was fun. But secondly, I've been telling students for years that the theory that we were teaching really was important, that you didn't have to just learn what's going to be usable tomorrow, but with the theory, it goes on for a long time. And with the world changing rapidly, it was important to get that. Well, here was a chance going out in the company, being able to demonstrate that uh, the theory did matter. And so we started again, like a bit, there was no products in mind, but we rapidly did get involved with some. I won't go through all of them. Uh, uh, one turned out, for example, to be a satellite terminal for the Air Force. For that, we either could build it with a lot of hardware. At that time, there were no individual chip CPUs, but there were arithmetic logic unit chips, register chips, etc. We decided to put together a small processor and do all the signal handling in the processor. And in order to keep everything small, we kept a small set of instructions, a small number of shift registers. I think it was the very first RISC processor. And we ended up being able to do all the communications, encryption algorithm, the whole range of capabilities on that processor. Again, didn't realize that that would foreshadow in cell phones all the computing is being done in RISC processors, at least except for one company. <laughs> and so, uh, again, at, uh, at Link a bit, we did a number of interesting things. We won a contract from HBO to have um, uh, scrambled signals from satellites to home, had to then get into the chip making business to be able to make a little home <coughs> descrambler and have that available. There was no software available in those days, just some university research ongoing. We gathered the research, put it all together, developed three chips. And amazingly, they all worked the first time through. So that gives a lot of confidence in the, this whole area. In any case, uh, sold Linkabit in uh, 80, I'm sorry, in 1980. And I have trouble with decades these days. <laughs> and 
Um, some management change occurred at the very top. It had been another PhD from MIT, and I was executive VP, but they tried to decide to change his job, and so I decided it was getting time to leave, and in 85 did leave. The last thing I did there, actually, was demonstrate a new wireless digital phone based on TDMA that we did for another company and developed it at Linkabit. Retired for three months, decided that wasn't much fun, and uh, go back to teaching or not? Well, six others that work with me at Linkabit said, let's start another company. Linkabit had grown 50, 60% a year. It was very successful, profitable every year. I said, okay, but you know, we can't repeat that. We didn't again have a product in mind or any specific financing. Uh, but let's go ahead, it's fun working together. And so that's how Qualcomm started again without any particular product in mind. We thought, as Linkabit, uh, it was the case with Linkabit, where we'd be doing military and government work for the first uh, number of years. By that time, it was very hard to get government contracts because of all the bureaucracy that had crept into the procurement systems. But people knew us from Linkabit, so one of the things we had was an invitation to do some consulting for Hughes Aircraft, and they were trying, they had proposed to the FCC a mobile satellite system, satellites to provide mobile voice uh, to users. And they asked us to come in and review the proposal. There's some small improvements that might be, might be made. And it was really TDM, TDMA, FDMA on the various links, multi-antenna beams. Um, and after the second meeting, driving home, it suddenly occurred to me that perhaps CDMA might be a better choice for that particular system. And what kind of drove the idea was with a mobile system, you can't pack together lots of users before you go off into the narrow bandwidth component. Uh, you only have the one person. If you give up a channel, so once somebody else can use it, you can't get it back in time, and therefore you can't uh, share it that way. But with CDMA, the whole capacity is based on how much interference are you receiving from other users. If you, those users are not speaking at that point, no interference, and therefore, you can get by with many more users on average in the given amount of spectrum. And so, uh, Klein Gilhouse, another engineer who unfortunately just died a week or so ago, uh, was in the car, suggested to him that uh, go take a look at CDMA, and uh, here's some interesting possibilities we talked about a bit. And came back in a couple of days later, and the company was still tiny, came back a couple of days later and said, you know, how's it going? And he said, were you really serious? So I said, yeah, let's, let's really take a hot. So he did, came up with a number of interesting other ideas. And uh, we became excited about CDMA. But we didn't have the funds at that point to proceed. So we developed a different product, uh, an Omnitrax, uh, a satellite communication system for the trucking industry. Just one note on that. Um, the uh, JPL had just issued a contract, I think, to try to develop a $45,000 small antenna to put on a truck, we had to come up with one for $45. And it turned out that the antenna work and the EM theory work from Cornell did give me the clue that, that how we would do it. And we did get that product launched. And I think for 25 years, that product turned out providing great fund source for Qualcomm. But in any case, once we had the very first one sold, which turned out to be in October, of 1988, we started the company July of 85. October of 88, we uh, said, OK, let's go back and look at CDMA. And now cellular had begun to grow, and for the cellular industry. And so we began to work on it. But the industry, during that period, had been looking, how do we go from analog first generation to digital second generation, focused on voice? And I think our R&D labs around the world had looked at the possibility of CDMA, TDMA, and FDMA. And CDMA had been thrown out either. Wouldn't buy very much, too complicated, problems you couldn't solve. And so people had left that alone. And there was a battle uh, between TDMA and FDMA. There was a vote in January of 89 here in the US to go with TDMA. Europe then had also set together a agreement among all the governments in Europe to go with GSM based on TDMA. So everybody was running in the TDMA direction. 
And um, we felt confident enough about two months or three months after that vote to go out and talk with a cellular carrier about maybe CDMA really is the right solution. And we gave enough information that it sounded possible. The argument was the following one, that with TDMA at best you get about three times the capacity per megahertz per antenna that you could get with the analog. But with CDMA, a very much larger number, and at least 10 to 20 times, maybe up to 50, which by the way is where we did get to. Um, and so that intrigued the operators because it had that promise of uh, more capacity. But they set up a presentation to a group about this size uh, in Chicago, made that presentation with view graphs, and uh, nobody found any holes. I thought maybe 50% probability somebody would raise a hand and say, you forgot X, but nobody did. But of course, nobody believed it either. <laughs> They didn't get too worked up over it. And so we had to go build a demonstration system. So we went ahead and in three or four months built a phone, a mobile phone, took a van to drive it around, and a couple of base stations, and invited people to come out to San Diego to see a demonstration. This, this, this did really work. We'd solved the, the power control problem. We solved handoff. How do you handle multipath? Whole range of different issues to do with CDMA. People came out and made a presentation on CDMA, and just as I was about to say, okay, some go out to the van, some go out to the labs, we sent both sides of the call, had a way from the back of the room, keep talking. And as I often say, one of the values of having been at a university professor is you can always talk for another 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I think if it had gone a little bit over that, there may never have been a Qualcomm, but I had another wave, it's okay. And what had happened, we were using the GPS satellite, was still experimental at the time, as a sort of time and frequency uh, synchronization. And one came over the horizon with a bug, threw us off, took a while to find it, get it reset, and then out we went. So another 10 minutes, there probably wouldn't have been a Qualcomm. Any case, that was successful, but then we had the problem of how do you go from a van to a handheld phone? And um, to do that, you had to develop some chips. That was an expensive proposition, even now with some software available to do that. And um, how do you raise that money? And so we came up, you can innovate in products, you can innovate in business plans, et cetera. I came up with the idea of licensing the technology where the licensee would pay an upfront amount, which would give us the money to do the research. And should this ever become practical, which nobody really believed, uh, then a small royalty per phone. And uh, the carriers were excited, so they put pressure on some of the manufacturers. And AT&T actually was the very first manufacturer to sign up uh, for the program. Nokia was third or fourth or so. And we did get a number doing that, did get the funding to go ahead, develop the chips, build a small phone, and two years later, invited everybody back to San Diego to see a demonstration with a commercial sized phone and infrastructure. That was good, but then the question was whether it goes to a standards process. Well, any communications has to be international. Be international, international, you need to have uh, a standards. So another year and a half going through the standards process, came out of that, and the very first system went commercial in Hong Kong in October of, 85, of 95. So it was seven years since we went back to look at CDMA to the very first commercial system. And that one was interesting because nobody else would build CDMA phones. Nobody thought there would ever be a market for it. So we had to set up a production line for phones build the infrastructure, in that case, uh, Motorola did come on on the infrastructure side, not the phone side, and uh, built, uh, converted the infrastructure. Why Hong Kong, by the way? Well, everybody was walking the street with their phone, that was their business office, and so it was very congested. The CDMA gave the additional capacity that turned out to be very helpful. Next, uh, South Korea, they had adopted CDMA based on an argument that until then, all their consumer electronics manufacturing had been a year or two behind Japan, 
here was a chance to leapfrog Japan and get ahead if they went CDMA, and it worked. And uh, this was back in uh, 92. So the beginning of 96, they launched uh, two CDMA networks, and that went ahead. And then it came back here to the US, and we launched a number of networks here. During that whole period, we went through what's been called religious wars, because the TDMA was, had a big head start. GSM uh, at that time was only TDMA, so there were battles. And the one I remember most we resulted in a front page article in the Wall Street Journal saying, Jacob's hype is going to cost operators billions. And uh, argued that this CDMA you know, was not gonna work and quoted a Stanford professor saying again, technical problems, et cetera. Another Stanford professor had been saying we violated the laws of physics. <laughs> it's not a good thing to do. To the day, to this day, when I go and give a talk at Stanford, I always point out that CDMA now works everywhere in the world, except within a 10-mile radius of Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> so we get back a little connection. There's a whole bunch of interesting stories how you get this technology out there. We, uh, for example, went to China, and in 92, beginning of 92, gave some lectures, but then there were battles between ministries and people that controlled the spectrum, and European uh, manufacturers had been there earlier than we were there. And so it actually took about 10 years to get through. And it uh, actually was a discussion with a premier of China, who luckily had been a radio engineer, that kind of gave us a bit of a breakthrough to, uh, to be able to, if we met certain conditions, be able to start in China. The best laid plans, as we all know, never quite work out the way you expect. So in China, for example, the, I think ATT might have been, Hallucent at the time might have been one of them, getting ready to sign contracts for CDMA in China, and suddenly a, the US bombed the Chinese embassy in Belfast. Chinese assumed it wasn't accidental, and so that killed everything for a year, so that held up everything for a year. We're getting ready to sign again, and if you might remember, there was a reconnaissance plane, a Chinese jet got too close, the Chinese jet crashed, the American plane came down. That delayed everything for a year. So finally, after the 10 years, we did get into China, and it was interesting because Wall Street, of course, plays a major role in all lives these days, but the analysts were saying, why did I bother spending all this time trying to get into China? There already were 260 million subscribers in China. That was the entire middle class. There weren't going to be any more phones sold in China. <laughs> so sometimes you, you can't follow <laughs> where the analysts are leading. You have to go ahead with it. Well, the next step, of course, was adding data. We had been looking at data along with voice, because CDMA worked very nicely with data. Uh, packets are on and then off a lot, so you're not using up channel space. And um, uh, in Europe, uh, the various manufacturers began to look, how can we go to the third generation data plus voice? And everybody finally settled in on one form or another of CDMA. So CDMA now is the only technology used in all third generation equipment that's probably well over three billion people using it to access the internet around the world. So ultimately, the wars did settle down. Actually, GSM, no longer TDMA, it's still sometimes called GSM, but now it's third generation based on CDMA. Well, the world keeps moving ahead, so now we're going into fourth generation. What's that gonna be about? Well, some spatial selectivity had increased, but I think it's a whole range, both of different frequencies and different cell sizes. Uh, so you have the large macro cells, we have the smaller um, uh, cells that take uh, local areas, small cells, mic micro cells, cells in homes. I think more and more we're going to see a range of different size cells and a range of frequencies, among which, in fact, we're already putting it in chips now, a 60 gigahertz, so you get a very wide bandwidth, so you can send your ultra HD TV signal from your phone, where you might have taken the TV, to a large screen and do that, again, wirelessly. 
well, how do you manage all these different frequencies? How do you manage all these, these different technologies, cell sizes? I think that's where uh, uh, the 5G really comes in and that we have to worry about the latency, we have to worry about a whole range of different power levels. So a whole range, largely of network problems. So I think a lot of that work is gonna be done in this neighborhood as well. Uh, that in going to 5G with a lot of interesting issues. The other interesting aspect, of course, is the applications area and all kinds of new things that will be happening. So um, I mentioned robotics and drones that I'm sure Claude would have been very interested in. Uh, but all kinds of new things. So we very early on began to f focus, among others, on medical uses of wireless technology, and those, I think, are going to be a next major growth industry. Been very involved with wireless education, mobile devices, which have gotten smart for three decades, I think we talked about using technology in education, never really got anywhere. This decade, no question, I think we're going to be already started, but making some great progress get rid of those print books and go entirely to digital textbooks with all the capabilities you get from digital te uh, technology and all the software that goes with it. So uh, we're there. Thinking again back to perhaps the most valuable lesson I think I learned from Claude um, was to do things in an elegant fashion. Don't look for a brute force way of doing things, look for, make sure the math is okay and you have the backup, but look for an elegant way of doing it, one that feels good in the gut, and then run with it. And so that's worked out very, very well so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to say, my first phone was a Qualcomm phone, so personal thanks. Uh -huh. And uh, I think your work has inspired me to get into this industry and uh, the graduate work uh, at, at MIT, so personal thanks uh, as well. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions for Dr. Jacobs. Yes, right there in the middle. Uh, could you comment uh, from your experience um, how how, how much do you think was important to understand fundamental limits established by Shannon and others in order to drive innovation in, in your career? And maybe also how relevant you think that is still today to establish limits and what is achievable, what is not achievable in order to drive innovation? All right. Um, as I mentioned, uh, actually going back to the textbook, we're worried about what was achievable, how much EB and then zero do you need, et cetera. And uh, the theory, I think, obviously turned out to be very useful. So with cell phones, when you're sending data, and with CDMA in particular, the capacity limits are due to interference. That says that you need to get the lowest energy per bit to noise density uh, that you can achieve, and the theory provided that. And then the coding, of course, in uh, people working in information theory, has gotten better and better, so you're getting very close to that limit. And so that's been... Uh, allow cell phones to provide the capacity capability that otherwise we wouldn't have had. And now we're going to spatial directivity to be able to have less interference by pointing the antennas because you go up in frequency. And um, that, again, will give some other possibilities as far as uh, the theory. But an interesting one, at MIT, I sat in on uh, Claude Shannon used to give uh, graduate seminars and part of one of them had to do with source coding. And so we often talk about the channel coding side, but the source coding side was obviously very critical. How do you convert speech or television to bits in a very efficient way with uh, uh, just a small amount of distortion? And so the rate distortion theory that Claude came up with uh, uh, turned out also to be very valuable. Although again, when you're studying these things, you're never quite sure. So the theory remains critical. You can never tell where it's going to turn out to be very helpful. Yeah. One other question, maybe? So you, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. And you made one reference uh, to when you found Qualcomm. You actually didn't have any business plan in mind, no product. 
So that's something it's very hard to understand for someone that wants to found a company today because you have to have elaborate business plans. And if you look at Bell Labs, actually, <coughs> we try to solve also big problems, not, not having necessarily a product in mind. So do you think that it's uh, important to be successful, not to focus too much on an initial product, but having more the idea of solving big problems? Well, it's always an issue. First of all, we started both Linkovit and Qualcomm without a business plan, without a product in mind, and in neither case did we ever have venture financing, which gave us a lot greater flexibility. And in both, in particular Qualcomm, but in both cases, we tried to put together a stream of products because you can never tell on the first whether it's going to be successful or not, so you want to have a few in the pipeline coming along. Hopefully one is successful and pays for the next group that come through, and so that approach uh, worked very well. The other, th there's some that say to be a successful entrepreneur, you've got to accept failure. So you have one idea, you carry it, it doesn't get through, you fail, but you bounce back, do a second, third. I'm not a great believer in failure, but, so <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's always much better to be flexible, to have a few ideas in mind, and you pursue them, you make some dynamic corrections as you're going along, but you, at some point, try to find that path that's going to allow you to be successful, or if you've had some other ideas, you can say, okay, that one I've taken far enough, let me leave it and go on to the other. And that was what we actually did with CDMA. We were, initially, we decided to go with the truck communication because we'd see a path there more rapidly, but we kept CDMA and then came back to it. And so, the key item, though, is to be accepting risk. You have to be careful with risk, look at what the downside, the upside, but be very willing to live with risk. As long as you, as soon as you start trying to play things safe, the world runs past you. And so if you're not continuing to run ahead, you're in great trouble. So that's the other aspect. If you start a company, be prepared to accept that risk, be prepared for the fact nothing ever gets done in the time period you originally imagined, but make sure you don't fail. Thank you. So I would like to invite, oh, yes. I'd like to invite Marcus to come We in. have one more thing for you. You don't get away that easily. So we have to go over here okay. so we can have a photograph with you. But that was fantastic. That's exactly what I tell the researchers. I often get asked, this is for you. Uh -huh. You are the first, by the way, Beautiful. recipient uh -huh. of the uh, first Shang Visionary Award.